for coming the long way every person traveled to come to mid camp in the air mid air camp is what i've been calling it um <clears throat> presenting on when there's not a module for that um my name is ben melanson um my would be co-presented Mauricio Donarte. He's um, ill and cannot make it. It is not COVID-19, but I'm really hoping he does not catch that in the hospital. Um, you can find me at MLNCN just about everywhere online. Um, Drupal.org, Twitter, uh, social.coop, a Mastodon instance, et cetera, et cetera. And Mauricio is Dinarcon most places. And together, we are one third of Agaric. Um, Agaric is a worker owned web development cooperative. Uh, you can reach us at ask at agaric.coop. And um, I'm working alone. I'm a little bit behind on getting um, the attendant resources I wanted to get up to go with this um, presentation. A whole blog post with the really well documented links for all of this stuff. It's not there yet. So you can email me uh, at askatagark.coop and demand it. Um, again, thank you for coming to Midair Camp. When building a Drupal site, there's a module for that. Can be the sweetest words that you hear. What you need is right there. But what do you do when there's not a module for that? You make your own. It's easy. Say you're creating a site where people can relive great literature that may have been inspired by also um, times of great hardship. Um, and you are, um, you know, you, you like it, you know, you've got your content type, you've done this through the UI like you always do. Um, you went to structure content and created a content type. Um, but the save button just isn't really speaking to you for, for your new content type Frankenstein. Um, so how can we change that? You can do that with two files, a total of four lines uh, each, and that's counting the opening PHP in the second line. Um, your, um, the first line, the first file is um, an info file. You always need that for a module and you always name it after your module. So whatever you create a, a folder, you give that a name that only has um, lowercase letters and underscores, and and then you create a file in that folder with exactly the same um, name as the folder with .info.yml after it. And you can give it a name, a type module. The description is completely optional. Don't even need that line, but it's good to have. And then the core compatibility, which would usually be 8.x, but now we're the cool kids and we can say it's 8.x or 9.x. And yeah, you can be pretty sure it's gonna work just the same for everything I'm gonna show you and for most of the other um, work you need. So it's a great time to make a module. The upgrade path is really easy. And then the dot module file itself. Um, you can, you know, um, you get into Drupal the old fashioned way with hooks. Drupal has throughout its code base, it has little things that call out and say, hey, does anyone want to change something here, do something here? Um, and a lot of those are alter hooks and you can get into an alter hook with a special name. Um, so, Frankenstein form, node Frankenstein form alter, um, we are, doing a form alter on a, on a uh, form named uh, node Frankenstein form. And then the only variable that's used there is the, the dollar, the form. It's being passed in by reference. That what the ampersand is doing. And then form action submit value. We're changing the value of our button to from save to reanimate. Um, and the good news is that that just changes the text label. It does not actually change anything the way it's submitted. Um, so we're not breaking anything by doing this. Um, most important thing, where to put the files. If you're doing a custom module in your code base, 
you'll see core files, libraries, modules, profiles, sites, themes, you put it in modules. It's really simple in Drupal 8 and Drupal 9. Um, and then you should create, I recommend creating subdirectories for contrib and custom so they don't get mixed together, but Drupal will look everywhere under modules and find it. So you could name this, this anything, you could call it like my special module, site specific, whatever you want. Um, but contrib custom is a good, um, a good convention. And then you put it there and that's the name of the folder we covered. And voila! Our form looks exactly the same. Um, uh, oh yeah, enable your module. If you're using Drush, Drush minus Y and Frankenstein, and uh, that slide was the most important you're going to be shown, we'll show it again. Enable your module after you start writing it. Um, and boom, we have our form with reanimate. All done, you know how to make a module. Oh, so you're sitting there thinking, sure, it's easy if you know the exact words and symbols to put in that file. And you're absolutely right. So we're going to show you how you can figure all of that out. Um, yeah. Looks great if you know exactly what to write. How do you get to the point of knowing what to write? Um, the examples we're going to show, including the one we just did, we'll look, think, talk about that for a second more. Um, the few basic approaches give you a lot of power. Um, so with these specific examples about, you know, form alters, so that's the most important thing to know that if you want, you see a form and you want to change it, you can do it with a, a form alter. And that gives you like that first step to be like, okay, I can find other examples, I can find documentation, I can find help um, and see how others are doing it. Um, it's way better than starting out with just like, um, I want to change a button. Like that'll give you a million results that don't help you knowing that if it's on a form and you want to change it, you want to do a form alt, you can get the specific results. Um, but before going further into these specific examples, um, which will give a lot of practical tools. Uh, two secrets. One's good news, second one is bad news. Um, now you know where to paste. Um, and knowing where to paste unleashes the power of Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange. Yes, that's uh, the family of sites that has helped a couple million developers figure out how to quit Vim. Um, but you find something on the, the Drupal.org forums, um, or Stack Overflow, um, knowing like just how to make that code interact with your site, you now know enough to be dangerous. Um, and then that simple form alter has a few gotchas. That, um, it only applies to the create add form, um, not the edit form. But you know, you only want reanimate for the first edition of the monster anyhow. You don't need it on the edit form, um, but um, you know, the, the form of the documentation goes through, um, you know, how to identify what form you're on. Um, and then you'll see when you look at it that it's actually a different form ID. And then there's other way, there's, you know, there's a lot of complexities in how you can deal with forms, um, but it's all been done. You can find examples and, and do it. So if you need it on both the add and edit form, you either use two IDs, um, or else you, uh, or else you can, you know, use the base form and load the node and check what type the node is, and then change the form based on the node type. Um, and yeah, there's tons of variations to that form alter hook, and all are valid. So there's always many ways to do something in Drupal. With our dirty secrets acknowledged, on with the show. We'll start with how not to make a module, um, and that's. Uh, how to find one so that you don't have to make one because that's always the easiest module to make is one you don't have to make yourself um, and not how to not how not to have to make a whole module um, how to contribute to an existing module um, and then how to make a module which we just covered and how to figure out how to make a module uh, so more on where to look for these resources um, so really useful things form alter node insert um, block and formatter. Um, so hooks, 
um, is one category of thing. And we'll look at a couple specific examples. Plugins is a whole other category of how to change things in Drupal and Drupal 8. Um, block and formatter. And then if we have time, we'll go into services, which is um, still another way to um, just change what is there in Drupal. It's, Drupal is like the, has the most capability of you modifying it while still keeping the core um, intact and the same and everything else you build on it. All right. And so like we're saying, if you're doing something with a form, hook form alters, which you're going to want to do there. And preview of learning to learn. Um, you know, how do you actually know where to start? Drupal documentation is pretty good. Drupal contributed modules. You just go find another module and look at its code base. That is the most useful way I feel. Um, I put Drupal core in its modules as not as favored as looking at other contributed modules because even though Drupal core has a ton of modules right now, and it's awesome that like they keep moving components out of like the mass of things you can't change and into modules that you could actually like turn off and replace if you wanted to. Like if you really, really wanted to, you could like fork the entire node module or clone the node module and do something else with it. Um, you know, Drupal core is super flexible, but its modules tend to have more stuff hard coded. Um, it's, it, it, it has a long history and it's been able to get away with stuff. So like user module still has a whole bunch of hard coded things. So looking at user module for examples of how you can um, override things in core is frequently not a, a good model. So um, looking at other contributed modules, if there's anything vaguely in the space of what you're trying to do, um, is great. Just going through its code is a big, great way to learn. Um, searching Drupal forms and issues. Stack Exchange. There's a official Drupal dot Stack Exchange, um, which has been, you know, where a lot more of the action has been. Is the forms a little quieter? Um, Drupal issues, though, are still where like everything gets hashed out. So you'll frequently there'll be patches in the issues that will be specific code. Frequently, you can you know, take a patch and make a module of it. Um, or you can, as we're going to cover and contributing to modules that are already there, take a patch and, and move it, um, move it forward. So it actually gets into the module and you and everyone can use it. And then, yeah, just searching the general internet. There's lots of great blog posts out there. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how to narrow your search so that you can get better results. Um, and then using a code debugger, which we will not really go into, but yes, it is definitely worthwhile to set up um, so that you can put in a breakpoint in some other module and see what it's doing. And then code search grep, um, which actually can really be helpful. Um, you know, you want to change something on Drupal on, on a Drupal site, you can see in the interface that there's some text that appears to be coming from code or a class in the um, in the HTML or some kind of, you know, something you can see in the interface that you can trace back to the code um, is often your first step to how to change that. So when not to make a module? When there's an easier way. Find a contrib module that does what you want um, or if what you're trying to do should be in a template. If you're, what you're trying to do is very specific to the design of your site, um, and you don't think you're going to be changing themes, um, it can just be in template, but find a contrib module. Um, go to drupal.org, and if you click right on uh, download and extend, that is no longer showing you how to extend the site. So you got to go down over to modules and there. And once you're on the modules page, um, I recommend that you change the core compatibility to 8.x. Um, that's not what it is by default. It's just searching everything. And if you're on Drupal 8, that's um, not going to be so useful because um, there's like 30,000 additional modules that are Drupal 7 and below only. Um, and then also change the status to all projects. So those are the only things that have changed here. 
Um, just, uh, are you all looking at the download and extend page or are we looking at something else right now? Oh, we have, we have a Lego heart on the screen right now. That is not what's supposed to be on the screen right now. And, and we Ooh. have your presenter view too. All right, easier way. Hmm. Wow, that's not cool. My presenter view is different from the heart. All right. Hmm. Turn it off and turn it back on again. Yeah, all right. So this is the first page I mentioned. Pretty sure we were matching up until then. Um, sorry about that. Um, download page, um, as I said, the background there of the download extend page does not actually have anything to do with extending. It's just downloading Drupal. So if you're, you know, if you haven't gotten your own module before, you've been making do with what's in Drupal 8 core, which is, you know, often enough. Um, when searching for modules or just doing what modules other people recommended. When you're out searching for modules yourself, go down to build modules and then um, maintenance. And this is where I was saying the uh, uh, core compatibility is by default not eight, switch that and the status um, is by default only um, full projects, not sandbox projects. And when you're at the point of making a module yourself, um, it's, you know, likely to be worthwhile um, to, um, it, it's you know, really worth, likely to be worthwhile to start building on a sandbox module um, that someone else has done but never fully released, then it's to start yourself. So there's a module that almost does exactly what you want. This is where you contribute a patch or port it to Drupal 8 or 9. And there is um, really good documentation on porting a module. So that is, and there's so many, like I said, there's four times as many modules for Drupal 7 than for Drupal 8. Um, it's really likely. And so like, after you don't find the module in Drupal 8, like the next thing is to filter that for Drupal 7 and look there, um, and even go back down to Drupal 6. Um, but if it hasn't been updated in that long, it might be better to start fresh. But um, for a lot of things you wanna do, starting with Drupal 7 is gonna be better. All right. So this is an example of, uh, you know, finding module that uh, we did. This is David Valdez um, with the Garic and, you know, common notify. We wanted very useful thing. We wanted a module. Um, we wanted oh, we got a module, user story, you know, when a user went to the site and left a comment, they wanted to be notified when another comment was made. And the comment notify module existed, but it had a lot of bugs. Um, and so, you know, this here though is the greatest way to get into module building is um, to look at the code base of an existing module and, um, and fix whatever's broken. And if it's, you know, if it's really just something that's broken, everyone's gonna want that. If it's new enhancement, there's a possibility that um, the module maintainer isn't going to want it, but it's still the greatest for best first step because you're likely to get um, some support and feedback from other people who know the code you're trying to change and who, who may want the same things you do. And so um, in this case, it was a straightforward bug. And uh, David first wrote out, like, you know, where he found the error and what he thinks is wrong, and he did a patch. And the other thing that David does that makes him extremely effective in actually getting these patches in is he writes tests. Um, so if you just want to get into learning to write code, write tests. Everyone wants tests. More people will help you learn to write tests than anything else. Um, <laughs> and it's uh, still a under underutilized skill. Like there's um, been issues that are open for, um, you know, 
two years because no one's written a test and David or someone will write a test and it gets fixed within the next like two days. Um, so as far as contributing, writing tests is key. Um, so contributing like this does have its risks, of course. Um, David was made a maintainer of Comet Notify sometime after that patch, and now he routinely fixes issues there all by himself. So this is an issue filed by someone else. Um, David made the fix, um, but still, it's generally better for everyone um, that you end up becoming maintainer of an existing module than for you to make your own uh, with duplicate functionality. So, when to make a module? When you've identified to the best of your ability that there's definitely not something out there that does what you want to do. Um, I personally do not advocate introspection at this point. You might think, why am I trying to do something that no one else is trying to do? Forget about that. If you want it, it's good enough, it's real, go for it. Um, so, as a first step, and this sort of loops back to the other steps, I recommend um, writing up what you plan to do. You can do that on your own blog. You can go to groups.drupal.org and use the contributed modules ideas group. It's not a very frequently used group, but you know there's a few posts a year. Um, and it's just the act of writing down what you're going to try to do is going to clarify it a lot. And you'll think of 50 more things that you can search um, the general internet for, search the modules, existing modules, like you'll get so much more clarity on potential ways to get started. Other modules to build on, or um, you know, just the kind of uh, subsystems within Drupal that you're going to be building on. Um, so it may be the first time, like you may have thought of it only as like, I want, you know, uh, the copyright date to always be up to date on my site. Um, and you, this may be the first time that you're like, well, how would I actually do that? Uh, it should probably be in a block that can be placed in a region. And so now you're like, okay, I know what kind of module I wanna make, I wanna make a block module. Um, and so we'll look into blocks, which used to be done with hooks, now done with plugins. And it's still just two files. Um, you can create a whole block um, with just two files. So the info file we've already talked about, and then another file. In this case, because it's a plugin, it's not a dot module file. Um, and this is the, the new way of Drupal. The only annoying part for me is that it's like six nested um, uh, folders every time you're doing something. But this is where block plugins go. So any kind of, um, you know, anything that's not a dot module file now is you're doing uh, Drupal 8 object oriented stuff correctly is going to be in your source folder in your module. So we're in a module called copyright and within that module we have uh, a source folder SRC. Inside the source folder we have a plugin folder. Inside the plugin folder we have a block folder and finally we can put in our block. So first file, the info file, um, same before. Same as before, just the type of module, then the, then the core compatibility, which is required. Um, and we could also make this a pipe 9.x and it'll work just as well. And now in the plugin, you start with um, giving it its namespace, and the namespace is Drupal, and then your module name. Um, and then everything that's in the, the same, exact same folder structure we we're just looking at um, for plugin and block, it just, the source is implied, you don't put it there. Um, and this is the kind of thing that you need to pay attention to because even if you're copy and pasting from somewhere else, you need to change this to fit what you have. So you need to at least change uh, your, your, mod, your namespace to be your module name. Um, so even though this is, you know, so trivial, it's really important to pay attention to. And so we are going to extend uh, off of Drupal's blocks. We don't have to like figure out how 
to do everything the block system from the ground up. We use Drupal's core um, block block base. And this again um, is the easiest way to get started on this kind of thing. You know, you need to block the documentation um, on Drupal.org and API.Drupal.org in particular um, covers this well. So the um, plugins in Drupal frequently um, the the information in the comment is actually used and important. Um, and so you give the ID for the block in here. This is this is where it's defined. It used to be in like hook block info. Now it's just pulled right out of this um, special comment. And then you're extending the block base. That's what we're using above. And yeah. You know, this is simple as you can get, but is powerful, especially if you don't want to have to keep doing this in themes. Uh, if you're switching themes or have several themes, um, this kind of stuff can be done in, um, in template files, but it's honestly um, more upkeep in the long term than to get it into a block. Um, and the other reason to do a module instead of a template file is that in a module, you can, you're giving a little bit more control to the site builder and sometimes uh, the site administrator in these types of situations. So they can turn off this block. You can write settings for your module and all of that. So, um, you know, once we've extended block base, only thing we need to do is actually return um, is to have a build function that returns what we want in there. And in this case, we are, you know, just returning straight HTML markup, pound markup. This is, um, you know, this is the case throughout Drupal's render system. You can either return markup of, of actual HTML, or you can return, um, you, can, you can name the theme functions you want to do. And you can put theme functions in modules so that your module can then have it overridden um, by a theme, which is, you know, what you probably want to do when you're contributing a module, when it's a custom module, you don't necessarily care whether you're doing it in the module or in the theme um, when you want to change this markup a little bit. Um, but you know, as soon as you have HTML in one of these things, you probably want to step out and make a, a theme function. And you know, the crazy big module we mentioned at the end has 50 examples of that. Um, and you know, this is where you can access PHP. So, um, you know, we could be grabbing stuff from the database and combining things. In this case, we're just outputting the year. Um, super simple, um, but the power is, you know, you need a block, you want something in the block. Once you're at this point, you can do everything. You can query your database, um, you can load variables, and you can output them however you want. And so that is, um, a block plugin. Um, so, as I said, uh, do email me. I'll get a full list of resources out there. Um, most of the links that we are going to have um, go to Drupal's API reference, um, which is a really good place um, to. Uh, go for an overview of what tools are available for you in hooking into, into Drupal. Um, and uh, just, oh, and we're not gonna click through. Yes, there we go. Thank you. Um, so just a note on all of these links, I'm linking to the Drupal 9.0 version. Um, and these hooks all work in any version of Drupal 8.x almost without a question. For a long time, Drupal.org inadvertently treated 8.2 as the end all and be all version of Drupal. So you're in documentation and you click a link and it takes you to version 8.2. That's not because 8.2 is better or what should be your standard. It's not. It was just a bug. So once you're on you know, the API page, you can just chain, like, it lists all of them. And so you can go. And I recommend just going to the latest. Um, possible because that'll warn you if you're using something that's going to be deprecated um, or not. Yeah. 
most of the things you're going to encounter are going to be pretty stable throughout. Um, but, you know, switch the latest version to get warnings about if, if you're building on something that's deprecated and you can pick which better one to do. Um, so Hook Form Alter has tons of documentation there. Um, and then want, worth mentioning the hook entity extra field info for another way of getting data outputted on your site that lets a site manager um, uh, interact with it as opposed to you hard coding it. It, out, it makes a fake field which can be changed on the display fields. Um, and if you'd rather do it in one file with a plugin like we just did with the block, there's the extra field module. So there, is a, there are a lot of developer focused modules. Um, so like extra field module is just if you want to create a custom extra field. It just you know, takes all of this um, old style hooks and puts it in a new modern plugin. So sort of helping Drupal 8 get to where it's trying to go <laughs> in a contrib module. And it's just more convenient, it's, it's like that. So if you're trying to add an extra field, I do recommend extra field module and get yourself out of having to learn a bunch of hooks that will um, you know, be deprecated sometime around Drupal 10 or something. And then of course, you know, for learning what you're trying to do the rest of the internet. Um, do you recommend DuckDuckGo? Um, and then you do a hashtag, hash, whatever, a exclamation point G for Google results. Um, and one cool thing about DuckDuckGo is that you can do multiple sites. So if you want to say like, if you're not getting great results and you want to um, restrict it to a certain set, that's sort of why I put a guard call it blog here. I'm mostly joking. Um, but the, and it's a course, yeah, so a combination of, uh, you know, I try to put all my own notes on the internet. Um, and then so I can find what I wrote, um, I can go to DuckDuckGo and say, give me any results that are from agaric.coop, that are from data.agaric.com, that are from um, agaric.gitlab.io, where I'm throwing my raw notes right now. And that's all done in just one, like one search. So I can, you know, DuckDuckGo lets me restrict to a subset of the internet. Um, really easily. And you can do that. Like I trust this blog. I, I want to, you know, get things that are from Drupal.org um, and, you know, f you know, 10 other blogs and you can just search that and get sort of higher quality results. It's sort of nicer to get zero results sometimes than it is to scroll through a hundred results and realize none of them helped you. All right. So, um, yeah, sort of shortcuts, um, to generating modules. Um, one here that was generated with um, Drupal console. Is it? All right. Off, but we'll live. Um, is, is, so it's like, you know, it was, Drupal console is unfortunately um, not had, um, you know, the support needed to be, to be, maintained at the sort of level of promise had, but still works. Um, and, you know, for certain plugins, like uh, for CK editor, it's the, you can, yeah, that's a whole category of type of thing you might need. Um, it, yeah, it, the, that provided just about everything that was needed. This Mauricio made this um, and, you know, they contributed it. Um, and it was simple, got used by a ton of people. And it's slowly gotten more complex, more features over time as people need it. And that's sort of like the perfect module origin story. Like actually super easily generated by Drupal console um, and then extended. And that's, you know, um, it frequently um, just like Drupal itself, other modules will be extendable. Um, and you can just, you know, it's like, Oh, you need to do this, but you need it to work for um, Vimeo. Like, you can copy this. Like, you can either use the, you know, the generator and do it, or you can copy this one directly, um, and and just get the same thing. And another example of that is uh, the social share 
uh, module, um, social media links module, uh, which we added an email link to, um, just using its own hook system, its own way of plugging in. Um, and that's another one that'd be easy to follow. Um, so sometimes you're really building on another module and you don't even need to get a patch in. You can make a module that works with another module. You don't need to fork. Um, CK editor, which you definitely don't want to do. You don't need to fork social media links. Uh, you can just extend it. Um, so let's just click through there. Um, and again, you know, this covers where everything goes. The CK editor module will go here. Source code is where the stuff that matters. Um, and then the libraries um, that are needed for it to work go in libraries. Um, so um, this generated module has you know, thousands of users now. Um, and we have a blog post on just how it was built that I'll talk about. Um, And then this is the module with a million examples in it. And it's one that, uh, you know, maybe if I listened to my own advice and said, hey, this could go in a template, would never have been built. Um, but as a module that uses so much of the plugin system, um, it's, it's a pretty good one to learn from. And that's what I wanted to show is sort of the process of like, you know, how do I actually learn from another module? Um, I'm sure when Drupal.org gets better integrated with their GitLab code, it will be um, easier um, to look right at the code. Um, but right now, it's sort of like click on view commits uh, and then um, click on one of the commits. And now we're finally been brought over to git.drupalcode.org, the site running on GitLab. And from here, we can just get back to, um, you know, the actual code of the module. And so the other, one of the other key types of plugins out there is the um, field formatter plugin. So this is what allows you to, um, you know, to take what might be an existing um, content on your site. So it's already there. You don't need to have um, content editors go back and change how they input it. Um, you can just go and change how it's put out. And so this is all like, all of this is public. Every single module on drupal.org, you can go and click through and see the code without even downloading it. You can, of course, also uh, clone it, um, which is, which is uh, good to be able to grep and play with it um, on your computer, but you can, get a, you can learn a lot there. And so same as all plugins, uh, the front matter in, in, the, in the top of the class um, has key information. And you know, no one has this memorized. Everybody is following documentation or, um, or other examples just like this. Um, key thing about field formatters is you specify what field types they work on. And so this one is working on entity reference. Um, and in this case, it is, yeah, might be all entity reference. One of these is is more restricted to just taxonomy terms. Um, this one I think is is in, yeah. This one is uh, so we'll look at the other one in one second. This one is any entity reference. Um, it can displayed as a list um, with an with comma. And you know if that's not the the those kind of details aren't the important thing. The point is for when you want to override how something how a field is displayed. A field formatter is probably how you want to do it, and um, and what you can do is um, you know look at the current 
formatter. So this is sort of where we go to, um, you know, my what I was saying about just searching the code base. So like when you are um, editing the, you know, editing um, the display page on of a of a content type or a, a, a doesn't have to be nodes. Um, the entity system is pretty universalized, so you can change the display of tons of things um, and change how each field is displayed. And if you go there and you can, you know, change what the uh, what it's using, um, what its uh, output is, um, there'll be keywords in there um, that. So, like, you know, if if you had already had mine installed, um, but you have no idea where this code is, like you know, link label to the referenced entity. You search for that text, you're going to find this module um, and you're going to find the one that I stole it from, uh, essentially. And so that's how, you know, I'm, I'm actually overriding it, but um, need to add that back. And so things like this, the setting summary, like this is text that shows up there. So this is where like you have to, think about like what part of the text you're seeing is probably always static that way and which part is dynamic. Because, um, you know, if, um, you know, sort of like when we're looking at the create content page, it said create Frankenstein. Like which part, you know, is always there, it always says create. So I know I can search for create, I'll probably get too many results, but if I'm restricted to just the modules, the Drupal core modules folder, um, you know, I can probably find where that create link was made. When you have more text to work with, like list items separated by, like you can almost definitely find my code right here. And once you've found this, uh, you can do it. And that's essentially how I made this. Like I looked at the entity reference label formatter um, and what text it was putting out. And so I could find where the heck it was. And once I could find the class, I could extend it. And that's what this is doing. And so finding what's doing what you want to change and then extending it is generally what you want to do. And once you're there, you'll see if it's, um, you know, it's, it's, oh, it's a formatter and you follow through and all the formatters derived from, um, you know, one type of thing. Um, it's the way the class inheritance works. So they're all coming from like one root formatter. Um, but here we're extending this one that it was extending another one. And so we just inherit everything it has and we can change it as we want. Um, and, you know, field formatters are also cool because it's super easy to do settings, which is a huge thing about doing a module that you're going to contribute back. So, you know, if you're manipulating a field, the tools you have to make it useful for people are great. Um, so just really quickly um, on the other um, thing now this one because it's it's actually looking up the taxonomy term sequence in order to summarize things the best I can only target here the field type as entity reference um, and so if you need to target the type of field you're doing more specifically than that um, that is done with um, the function is applicable. So this function is always there. Um, and like when I drill down through the kinds of things that I'm inheriting from, it's there and I'm just overriding it here. Just say that it's only going to happen for taxonomy terms. So taxonomy terms are cool. If you want to manipulate them and you know, you you're, want a format to do it, this is how you do it. But more generally, you know, find the text that's related to the settings that you want to change look it up, uh, find where it is in the code base, whether it's uh, Drupal core or contrib, and make the change. So drilling all the way back to module page and there. So that's that module, um, which is doing tons of stuff with field formatters. Um, and uh, you know, it was a crazy need I had. Um, I just uh, didn't want to keep doing uh, you know, lists in, in templates all the time. It's like, okay, if this is the last word, 
then I stick the word and in between. But if there's only two items in the list, it does that. I wanted to put all that in the module. Um, and then I also needed the crazy like summarizing sequences capability. Um, but um, you know, I contributed it. So it's the right thing to do. Um, and but you know, the selfish reasons are people may contribute to what you put out there. And someone may take it over and upgrade it or improve it greatly. So there's a whole bunch of modules that I've created that I maintained badly that other people have taken over that I still get to use. And it is wonderful. Um, so recommend it. So as of yesterday, um, another module I put out there called workflow buttons. Um, you know, someone has added a, uh, added a, a contributed a patch very, very politely. Um, and it's, you know, gives me a, a great opportunity that I didn't have to uh, do the code for to show you a nice touch you can do on the modules you're contributing. Um, you may know where the settings are for your, the module you made, but other people won't. So this is the entirety of the patch um, that Jay Kandari here has contributed, um, just adding this configure link. So this is a nice touch. This is in the info.yaml yeah, file that we've all seen a couple times now. Um, and it's just, you know, saying that, okay, the settings page is at this um, um, path. And if we're interested, we'll look more into the services that are supplying um, those types of paths, which is another way to, to override. But I think I'll, I'll break for questions before then. Um, um, oh yeah, and that's the other, I, other example that you can find in, uh, in the in other words module is that it's bringing in a PHP library, um, which is another really great way to do a module. Like if you can't find something in Drupal that does what you need, but you find something else in PHP or possibly in JavaScript that's out there, just bringing in that other library um, is huge also. And so um, an example for that with, with PHP is the in other words module. In that case, I also wrote the PHP library, but it still shows you how to bring it in. Um, and then an uh, example of just bringing in a JavaScript library, which is a little frustrating right now because Drupal doesn't have a set play of how to load JavaScript libraries, but it still can be, there's some convenience to wrapping them in a module. Um, is, uh, oh, I'm just gonna blank on it. Um, anyway, uh, it's <laughs> it does, uh, it it uh, it it allows you to do range selection of of form buttons um, and to toggle them on and off. Um, and uh, I apparently did too many modules last year because I can't remember its name right now. But it's on the list of modules I contributed. Um, all right. So I think this is a pretty big piece because um, I think a lot of people aren't aware of of it in Drupal 8, one of the pieces of friction to sharing a module that you're working on is that like you've got your set of code and you have to do something to get that code out in public. Um, and like you got all of your code in a repository. Like, and then you have, you know, what exa how exactly do you have that, you know, and everything in Drupal is supposed to be managed by Composer now. Um, and that actually makes it easier. So instead of like trying to do some weird sub-module thing where like you keep the pure code version of the contributed module out there and then pull it in, but you can, you know, you want to just, you're developing it. You want to just be able to edit things, edit the changes and not, you know, have to like make your edits like out in some one spot push it up to drupal.org and pull it back into your site. That's not an efficient way to develop. Um, and so if, um, you know, you can get the best of both worlds by bringing in your module as a, a Git uh, repo in, with Composer. And so every time you do Composer update or Composer install, if, you, if you're, you know, going to a new site or someone is developing it with you, which is the other big thing, if in your, module composer.json, if you add a module composer.json, um, you can do that. So 
Drupal modules on Drupal.org, even though they're all using Composer, they don't need their own Composer, even though Drupal is using Composer. So like you say, Composer require Drupal slash module name, and it brings down the module name. That module doesn't have to have uh, a Composer.json file because Drupal.org is doing it for you. But if when you're developing your own module, I recommend you do create a Composer.json file um, so that you can bring it in as a dev um, module. So this is in specific composer. This is for another module we contributed um, called Cyborg Translate. Um, but that's not the important part right now. But you know, this is just standard composer, allows you to list all of this stuff. Um, I've created a little like uh, program I use locally. Um, it's also contributed to like convert these things into my readme file. So I'm not maintaining all of this in two places. Uh, it's a little project I call it write me. Um, don't even remember what language it's written in, probably PHP, anyway. Um, but like, you know, it, I, Composer is great because it sort of structures important information about your module. Um, but anyway, all it needs is just a file, this just so that um, we can point to it in our next step here. So this is our module composer.json, in the project that is using it, compo root composer.json, you can require it as normal. You know, there's Drupal core, there's a module, there's Drush, it's all you need for a website. Um, there's the standard Drupal repository. Um, and, then, um, and then there is our module. And, you know, doing this alone would work fine. Well, actually, hold on. Just doing it normally would work fine with, um, with a normal string. Um, but we're doing it with a special string. We're getting the dev version because we're developing it. Um, and then we're doing it as 1.x dev. And I don't even remember now what the reason for that is, but I spent way too much time uh, figuring out how to pull together uh, a bunch of separately maintained projects into one in a way that let me contribute to all of them really easily. Because um, we have these projects where we have like, we're using, you know, 20 contrib modules that we all, we're all maintaining. And so we want to bring them in. Um, so I'm sharing that with you. And I think that's something that's not um, well enough known or documented to bring in your module um, with um, as 1.x dev. And then in when you you know, name a specific re repository, um, it works. So right now we're pushing up to uh, GitLab and to Drupal. I haven't actually tested to see if this will work just with Drupal now that Drupal's halfway to GitLab. It may, um, but um, you know, if not, you can just have it to on on Drupal and to on you know Drupal.org and on GitHub or GitLab or something like that. Uh, I do also have another little program that just like keeps everything in sync um called hacky sync um so um you know if if that becomes a pain point um got a solution for that too um and that is just about that um so start small Bite off a piece that you can chew. Um, it's a wild world out there. Um, do not be afraid of it. And uh, I'm looking forward to any questions. Um, and I'll um, supposed to be saying now links for all of this and more on the session page. Again, I'm not up to speed with all the all these contributed links and formatting. Um, this presentation as a blog post that's going to be a lot more useful um, than going through the presentation again. Um, so if you want it, email me um, at askatagarg.coop and I will, you'll be the first to know uh, when it's up, hopefully later today. Um, and we'll add it to the session link there too at mid.camp slash 6337. Um, and now I'm also supposed to plug uh, the code sprint. Um, so uh, Bob, if you could take it from me or Brian. Sure. Let me uh, 
I'll go ahead and share my, I've, I've put the link by the way, um, in the, uh, in the chat for the evaluation form that'll take you to the node for the session and the evaluation forms are at the bottom of that. So you'll want to take a look at that. And, um, as far as the contribution day, uh, that'll be in the schedule on, uh, on, uh, uh, midcamp.org. And, uh, you can just go there on Saturday. Uh, and those sessions won't be open until Saturday. So be aware of that. Um, so we have about, I don't know, three minutes, four minutes before we're officially done. But, uh, depending on how long Ben wants to hang around, uh, I can hang around, uh, that long as well. Uh, we're at our lunch break at noon from noon to uh, one fifteen central time. Uh, so that's where we're at right now. Anybody have any questions for Ben or? If you do, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. <laughs> or else I'll start unmuting people at random. There we go. <laughs> Point. <laughs> it's all quiet out there, Ben. They don't have any questions. You did such a good job explaining. Thank you so much. That's it. Thank you all. Um, yeah, hit me up if you think any questions later, or if you're all secretly trapped and unable to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the case. I don't think so. But yeah. Oh, <laughs> all right, folks. Thanks for bearing bearing with us on the delays, uh, and we'll uh, we'll go for there from there. Uh, have a good rest of the camp, and uh, we'll see you in another room. Thank you, Bob. Okay, no. <laughs> Ciao. Are you actually?